could please rise for the pledge. Board members are present this evening. Uh, before moving uh, forward, um, the agenda, do I have any announcements from anyone? Um, this was past week I attended the Erie County School Boards Association meeting, uh, delegate meeting, and I just want to announce that on October 1st, um, Don, Dennis, and myself are, um, are getting an award from the Erie County School Boards. And most of the talk at that meeting was all about the different districts and their opening plans. So, thank you. Anything else? All right. um, next on the agenda, there's an item for those that have the, the, the formal agenda uh, for a move to executive session to discuss the legal investigation report. Uh, we had moved to executive session before people arrived to spare people uh, the time waiting for us. Uh, so that has, uh, we have adjourned that and are now back into public session. <clears throat> Can I get a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? I'll make a motion. Thank you. Do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. In our packet, we have uh, meeting minutes from our meeting on August 24th. If I could get a motion to approve those, unless there's questions. Thank you, Don. Do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries. All right. Uh, next item in the agenda uh, is correspondence. Um, have a number uh, that we've received over the last, since the August 25th meeting. Uh, the more majority, if not all, were received within the last week. Uh, as of about 4 o'clock today, we've received uh, 24 email communications directly to all board members. I know. Uh, there's, there's been individual contact as well, uh, primarily concerning uh, fall athletics. Just to characterize those comments and without getting into reading all of them, we had about seven uh, that encouraged us to support a safe uh, restart of all fall sports that are authorized by New York State. We had about another six that on top of encouraging us to approve the restart for fall athletics authorized, also touched on the extracurricular activities. We had uh, three uh, specific emails encouraging us to support um, the restart of the modified program at the middle school. <clears throat> we had two uh, specific to the swim program, one to the swim club and opening of facilities, uh, one asking for the support of a safe restart on gymnastics, uh, we had one uh, that actually uh, asked us to consider uh, what a move to uh, the spring would be for all these sports, similar to what the initial proposal was to do the three split seasons uh, effective after the first of the year. Their concern was the interest of allowing greater participation if we delayed it versus what we might have to do considering the current format. We had uh, one. Um, that was uh, specific to the restart of just extracurriculars, specifically drama club and the Latin club. And then we had two emails uh, concerning uh, the varsity girls soccer coach. So with that, um, it's time to move forward to the public comment session portion of the agenda. It was, if you bear with me for a second, uh, we're gonna try to do, do the best we can in the circumstance of, of limiting the number of attendees physically in the room here. And we do have additional uh, individuals in the hall that would like to speak. So I'm going to read a, a few just parameters, if I could, uh, before opening the floor to everybody in here to, to address us at the microphone. Our ask is that after you're done speaking, if you could either, if you would like to return to your seat, but then once everybody's done, we're gonna ask everybody to leave to allow the others an opportunity to come come in and, and also make a statement. So with that said, again, as you approach the microphone, uh, please remember to state your name and address for the record. Um, we would ask that you direct all comments to the board. Uh, 
given the number of people that are looking to speak tonight, uh, if you would be uh, direct with your statements, it would be appreciated. We would ask that you could keep it to three minutes or less to allow everybody ample time to speak. And then we would like to keep the comments to one topic per speaker. If you have a second comment, if you would allow everybody to speak and then you can come back. So with that, I open the floor to anybody that has a statement for the board. We have two microphones. If you would like to come up and make a statement, just state your name and address and be happy to be heard. Jamie Nuara, I live at, you said my address, right? Yes. 4613 Brentwood Drive. Um, I'm basically just here to support the girls in the back. Um, they were hoping that um, you would, you know, we've we seen that you were, you know, you did make changes and stuff um, in the opening plan, but they want to try to uh, make sure that they get that, that yes vote to be able to swim. Thank you. My name is Kristen Zima. I live at 6325 Jennifer Court. And I'm here along with a bunch of other Clarence girls soccer players supporting Dave Steffen because we believe that he should not have been fired after all he has done for the girls soccer program. And we believe that all he has contributed to the school is important and that we should have backed him up following these allegations. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make a public statement? Or if, if you don't want to speak, I know I heard girls soccer, uh, the swim program, show of hands, how many are on the swim program here? Thank you. Rest with the girls soccer program. Okay, so I guess if you have nothing uh, that you want to directly speak, I appreciate you coming out for Coach um, Seven. If, if you wouldn't mind maybe excusing yourself to allow the next group in to address the board, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michelle, as people are moving in, I know we have this live streamed and there's an opportunity to ask questions or make comments. Do we have anything submitted? The only comment we have from a community member is to please allow the Clarence Swim Club to use the pool as if it is a very low risk sport. Okay. Thank you. And I'd just like to add, I know you mentioned 24 emails. You did respond to all of them. So thank you for doing that. Yeah.
as people are uh, finding their seats, um, again, I'll, I'll give you the brief overview I gave the last group. Apologize for the circumstance of having to uh, cycle people through the room uh, due to the guidelines we're operating under these days. Uh, but again, uh, just from a, a parameters perspective, we have two microphones if you'd like to make a statement when you do. Uh, we ask that you state your name and address for the record. Uh, limit uh, comments directed to the board, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and as you've saw from the group before, and I'm not sure how many are still out there, uh, in the interest of allowing everybody ample time to speak this evening, if you could be directing your comments, uh, we ask that you keep them to three minutes, if at all possible. Um, so with that, I open the floor uh, to whomever would like to speak first. Again, there's two microphones. Just state your name and address. Hi, I'm Kaylee O'Brien. Um, I live at 4125 Thornwood Lane. And I just came to speak on like behalf of our coach who just recently got fired from our girls varsity soccer team. And I just wanted to say how good of a coach that he was and how he always stressed that we had to make sure that our team was like a family and he always kept the atmosphere very high and made sure that everyone was enjoying themselves while also making it a competitive environment that we can work in. And I feel like he really is a reason why we've had so much success on our team and why our teams have always been, for the most part, extremely close and we've always supported each other through everything. So. I wanted you guys to know how important he is to me and a lot of the girls who want to keep winning. And we think that if coach was still our coach, it would be definitely possible. But I just wanted to say how important he is to all of us here today and how he always kept the atmosphere super good to be in. And we just enjoy, we want him to continue to be our coach. So Thank you. I'm Abby Bashera, 5958 Donegal Manor. Uh, I'm also here for girls varsity soccer. I just wanted to reiterate how invested Coach Stefan was and Clarence in the community. I mean, he coached me personally. He runs First Touch when I was four or five years old. And, you know, now <clears throat> I'm in high school and I think he just, he was always a good person even before he was a good coach and I think it's all just disorienting and confusing and I think people want to know why this nice man that we all knew as you know coach Stefan our coach was was removed from that position that he cared about and was involved in so heavily thank you Hi everyone, my name is Michael Faso at 9187 Beach Meadow Court, Clarence Center. My, uh, three of my children attended Clarence High School. All five of my children attended Clarence Schools. We've known Coach Stefan for many, many, many years. He has been an absolute fantastic influence on our children, all of them, boys and girls, and a great coach to them as well. As Kaylee said, Soccer aside, it's the person that we know in Dave Steffen that has been supportive of my children and made them not only the people they are, but the athletes they are. And uh, obviously there's information that you'll handle behind closed doors that we may not understand, but we're all here to support Coach Dave and the person, Mr. Steffen. Uh, he's a great coach and a great person. And uh, we please ask you to reconsider your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Rich Argentieri, 6284 Cloverleaf Circle of East Amherst. Um, here to speak in support of uh, Coach Stefan. On behalf of my daughter, Olivia, who's uh, away at college, uh, she had uh, Dave for four years of her varsity soccer career. Um, separate from his investment in her as a player, 
uh, was only surpassed by his investment um, in her as developing as a person. Um, and on behalf of the team, uh, the, the bond that he was able to establish, um, I think allowed um, each girl to understand winning is one thing, playing as a team, and being supportive of your teammates is another. And when you move off of the soccer pitch and move into life, it's really about how you can work for one another, with one another, and achieve success as a group rather than an individual. Uh, and that's more important. Um, my daughter was uh, certainly upset uh, when she heard the news, uh, given the influence that uh, Dave had on her, and she asked me to come and speak on her behalf. Uh, myself and my wife certainly had appreciated Dave's work, um, not only in the soccer program, but with our daughter, um, second athlete to come through Clarence High School, and we've always valued uh, the coaching influence that um, our daughters had got outside of the academic excellence that Clarence delivered. And um, we were surprised by this, but we would ask you, um, without knowing all the circumstances, to certainly reconsider uh, the decision and uh, the value that Dave brought, not only to the soccer program, but to each uh, student athlete that came through. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Bridget Fosso, 9187 Beach Meadow Court. Uh, again, I just would like to reiterate what my husband Michael said and uh, Rich Argentieri said. Uh, Coach Stefan has been such a positive influence on the Clarence girls varsity soccer program, but in addition to that, he's been such a positive influence in the Clarence community. Again, starting um, when they were five years old, uh, doing the soccer programs up at the Cl Clarence Soccer Center, um, you know, he's just been such an institution here at Clarence, he and his family. They spread such positive messages. Uh, they are so encouraging. They've been wonderful to each and every one of our children. Four of them have had him as a coach through the years. Uh, nothing but positive influences. And whether they sat the bench, which several of them did, or if they were on the field, starting every game, playing every minute, he treated them each equally and let them know that, again, there was no I in team. It's a team sport, and yes, of course we want to win, but at the end of the day, it's really about a family and creating a family atmosphere, and that's what Dave always did and tried to do. Um, and again, I know it's competitive, and I know, you know it's, it's not always fun, um, but again, at the end of the day, it is not all about winning, and Dave certainly instilled that into um, our children and again we would just ask you to please reconsider your uh, decision and help Dave to continue making positive uh, influences on all of our children again not just on the soccer field but in life thank you thank you three minutes huh it takes me three, three minutes just to say hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Tim Glaude. I live on Michael Douglas Drive uh, here in Clarence Center. Uh, my purpose of being here tonight, twofold actually, since the opportunity presented itself, I uh, just wanted to uh, make mention publicly to the board. I know in my household, I have not always made the most popular decisions when it comes to handling of the COVID uh, situation. So. Um, Oftentimes I had to tell my kids they couldn't do things for what was in their best interest and again that was not always the most popular decision and that was in my household of five. So to be able to work that throughout a district and create policy with so many moving parts, uh, I know nobody signed up for that. So um, thank you, thank you for your, for your help. I know you're, you're all doing that in the best interest of the kids and the community. So publicly thank you for that. You might not get that a whole lot out there. So uh, part two. I would also like to speak on behalf of Coach Stefan. Um, I think a very commendable, you've got sophomores, juniors, seniors, returning players coming back. That takes a lot of courage to get up here and speak. Um, so I think that speaks volumes to the type of person Coach Stefan was. Just in listening to some of this, I hear the word family. Um, I, personally, I've known Dave for seven, um, I'm sorry, 13 years. Uh, my son and Abby Bashar actually started First Touch when they were that high. Um, He's been nothing but a positive influence on myself. He's been a mentor for me when I coached house league soccer. He's been a mentor for all my children, um, but nothing, nothing but positive things to say about Dave. 
the recurring theme I keep hearing is family. And that's what it's about with Dave. He shows up at travel games. He shows up at house league games. He comes to watch the girls play whenever he gets a chance. That's what it's about building a program. That's being fully invested. And I, I just hope that for, for the negative comments, and I can't speak to what he's done or hasn't done or what influenced this decision. I can only speak for what I know. But for anything that has been said or done, I would hope that there's 20, 30 other people that have nothing but positive things to say about Dave. And I just hope that for a guy who's built his reputation for 17 years in doing it the right way is not tarnished by the opinions of a couple people. I just hope that we are making the right decision and not the easy decision. So thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. No, nobody else wants to come. Okay. I'm Maddie Rolston. I live 4477 Harris Hill Road. And Dave Steffen is such a positive influence on all of us. In my opinion, and in many of the girls' eyes, there's not a bad bone in his body. He has done nothing but help this team and to make us all one big family. And if there was a problem, he would always try to help us out with it. And he always tried to make us into better people as well as better soccer players. So he really wanted us to build our character into something positive to help the people around us and he's just a very amazing person and there's always going to be people that try to take other people down and there's always going to be negative comments on everyone so I ask you to please reconsider about Coach Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments at this time? Okay. Thank you all. Now we're going to move into the superintendent's report, which includes reopening and a proposal on the fall athletics program from Mr. Lembeck. I guess in the interest of it being a school night, and I know you're here to support the coach, if you'd like to stay, please do. If you'd like to part, um, Feel free to do that as well. Okay, um, we're trying to give the board every month an update of the reopening process until it's not necessary for us to do that anymore. Uh, but this month is big for us, so a couple of slides on the things that went extraordinarily well with the process and some things that we need to do better at and that we've been thinking through. Um, first, the positives. Uh, we had lots of good positive feedback from parents and kids and teachers on our reopening kind of soft first week. Uh, it reacclimated the kids, it taught them the health and safety procedures, and it allowed them to practice all the things that they would have to do when they got back. Um, one thing I can say unequivocally, and I've been in most of the buildings over the past three weeks, kids are happy to be back at school. This is a big deal and you can feel it. Uh, and not only that, they've been absolutely terrific with all the expectations that we've put on them. I have not, in this building, which has the most kids and probably the most prone to not following all the rules, uh, I have not had to say one thing to a student about masks. 
We've had a lot of that happen too, that you know, what James just did. Forget it's there. <laughs> so the kids have socially distanced, they've done the hallway thing, they've done the mask thing, they've been absolutely fantastic and that goes for every building. Um, all of our buses were on time and organized for the cohorts. So that's a big shout out to our bus supervisor and Rick who took care of that. This was an enormous undertaking, especially given the fact that 50% of the parents are, riding their ki are driving their kids. Uh, our buildings and grounds crew did a great job. The dividers that we have up here are in every classroom. They're smaller at the elementary level than they are here, but they provide another source of mitigation for us. And the guys had to do the whole thing by the first day of school and they were terrific. Not only that, the cleaning has been on par and we need more cleaners and we're trying to get that and Rick can address it during the board meeting. But the people who have been here, they really kicked it. They did a great job. Um, the early arrivers have been accommodated. So if moms or dads need to drop kids off early because of the work situation, we've got it covered. And it's gonna start getting cold probably in a couple of weeks. So if somebody does arrive super early, we'll take them in and have them sit outside the district office because Rick and I are always here very early. Uh, the all virtual day, the first one last Wednesday went really well. I had huge compliments from teachers. All the kids checked in. Uh, it, it went as, as good as it could possibly go with that half day kind of thing. Then our teachers worked for the second half of the day to develop lessons for the next week. Uh, we did have lots of pro positive parental feedback on it, which is good to hear because sometimes we don't get all of that. All right, some stuff we definitely need to work on. There's technology glitches with Schoology, connectivity at home. Uh, there was a little bit of a glitch with the distribution of devices. We have pretty much distributed every computer we had. Is that correct, Mr. Mancuso? Correct. We have a new order coming in. A big one, Rick? Yes, we're having um, probably 600 new computers coming in. So at this point, what we need to do is, some teachers need two computers when they teach. They need a Chromebook so they can see what their kids see and exactly what the experience is like, and then they can teach from their laptop. Uh, other teachers need iPads as well as their laptop, and we need to support them on that. So we're ordering a bunch of new stuff. Some of them need another monitor. Some of you may have this where you work, where uh, you can drag things between the monitors and it provides you with more screen space to be able to see the kids. The arrival and dismissal times have proven to be a challenge for the AM, not so much for the PM. But uh, it, you know, it backs up into the neighborhoods at Sheridan Hill and Harris Hill because there's only one point of egress from those buildings. We're working on it, it's gotten a lot better, it's steadily improving. Uh, the 100% remote teachers, they need some additional time and support. They're actually planning for two different lessons, when the kids are in front of them, and then when they have the 100% remote kids. Some of them are divided between hybrid and 100% remote, others are teaching two sections of 100% remote. They need help. Uh, they've worked extraordinarily hard, so we're gonna give them technology help, we're gonna try to get them aid support, and if we can work the schedule out so that the kids get double specials or something like that, we will also give them some release time for planning. We had a meeting with them today, Rob and I, you know, they have legitimate points, they're really trying, and we need to, we need to give them some additional support. So the last thing is we really can't afford to have kids switch anymore. You're, we're, we're pretty much standardized now for the next 20 weeks. Uh, if you're hybrid, you're hybrid. If you're 100% remote, you're 100% remote. It's very difficult to move kids back and forth at the elementary level because we went to great lengths to keep the class sizes balanced. The AM has more kids than the PM, as you would imagine. So the building principals worked with families. If they needed to switch from AM to PM and their letter of their alphabet wasn't there, they did what they could to accommodate requests. Uh, the YMCA program is up and running, correct, Rick? Correct. Uh, and we have a bunch of families over there so those are the things that worked well, or I mean that we still need to work on. Just Any on, questions at this point? On your last comment around, you know, we went into this knowing um, that it wasn't going to be the perfect schedule ever, but uh, certainly for some families there was gonna be hardships. We allowed them to request changes. You alluded to making those changes. Are there 
were we able to satisfy 100 percent you know 75 percent yeah i'd correct? say off the top of my head and correct me if i'm wrong on this rob or you know i'd say 80 percent of the people got what they what they were seeking which is pretty good in any year we wouldn't make changes based on the teacher but we would make changes based on work schedules for am pm and however the child care was working out especially if the kids were at the primary level of k1 or two so just a couple of quickie things that are brand new for the board. The Erie County Department of Health came out with some new guidance. Um, if a staff or student member is symptomatic, they need to go home, they need to be isolated, and they can only return with a note from their physician or a negative test or 10 days of quarantine. Many people who have a symptom don't go get a test. Um, they just sit out there 10 days, and if their symptoms become better, they can come back. Um, some do, and we can't force people to get tests, although we will facilitate them getting a test in one of the Erie County Department of Health locations. If a student or staff is positive for COVID and that student or staff was with, the, uh, with their classmates in a classroom for more than an hour, then they have to quarantine for 10 days from that positive test. They need to be fever free for 72 consecutive hours at the end of those 10 days without taking any fever medication. And they need to have improving respiratory uh, symptoms. Now the old way and the reason we bought the polycarbonate dividers and the reason we did all the setup the way we did was because the contact tracers were, go they were going to come into the building. They were going to look at the situation. They were going to interview some kids and some teachers and then they would make a decision on who needed to quarantine or not. There was a change to that last week. If you are in a classroom setting, and this would not be considered a classroom setting, this would have different rules to it. This is considered a large group instructional space and you have to skip every third row, okay? But if you were in a classroom setting and the, the cohort of children were in that classroom setting for 60 minutes or more, the new rule is the entire cohort needs to be for 14 days uh, quarantined. So we have, we have had one instance of a positive case. It was at the middle school. It worked the way it was supposed to. The Department of Health contacted the families. They allowed us to contact the teachers and everything that was supposed to be reported was reported. Every day, the principals by 3 p.m. must report any new positives. So I'm happy to say none, zero today. That means zero over the weekend uh, and that's good, okay? So when the Department of Health contacts us with a positive, they give us the student's name, they give us their date of birth, they give us the date of the test. And then we have to help them with the contact tracing. We give them the names and phone numbers of students who are within a classroom space for more than an hour. They don't count the buses. And I'm not sure what they're doing for lunch yet because we, haven't, we didn't have lunch on the day that we had the positive case. So, so Jeff? Jeff? Yes. Oh, down here. James. Oh, sorry, James. Uh, Looking around. If, if we have a t kid test positive on like a Sunday and he, he or she was not in class, you know, there's no Saturday, did we go back to Friday? We quarantine all those kids on Friday? Yeah. Like when they do the uh, contact tracing, yeah. they determine the date of the test and when the kid was last in school. Okay. So we'll go backward if they give us that. Now, the other thing they have to know is is this a 100% remote kid or was the kid positive during the time they were remote or were they positive during the time they were in person? Mm -hmm. So they need both of those pieces. In the situation that happened with us, the staff and or student had been last been in the building, even though we found out on a Sunday, the prior Tuesday. So they were not Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, okay. but they were the Tuesday and that's when we started the quarantine process via the Department of Health. And, uh, um, yeah. They're pretty, I'm sorry, Dennis, oh, just right. one quick then thing. You have to put that on the new state dashboard, right? Right. Okay. So originally the Department of Health told us if it happens on a weekend, you don't have to put it on your dashboard. Okay. Then they changed their mind last week and we had to put it on Wednesday. But it was really the Sunday, yes. Right. So it might've gotten a little confusing for people. Okay. But it is marked as one positive for historical purposes. And if it happens over the weekend, you have to put it on the Monday. That's the new rule. Tricia? Um, yeah, so if someone's in that, that's been exposed, and then you know how they have to, exp they have to quarantine for 14 days, 
like let's say day nine they go and get a test and they're negative they still can't come back still have they can't come back okay. if you had symptoms but not a positive and you got the test you can come back if you're positive you can come back after 10 days if you're a close contact you have to wait 14 days to come back so that's the deal it seems incongruous to some people that a close contact would have to stay out longer than a kid who actually had a positive case. But that's, Dr. Lynch can probably explain better than me. Uh, that's, that's the guy. That's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, no uh, so last thing, yeah, the dashboard, it's positive cases of student and staff, on-site and off-site, by school, then it calculates it itself for the district. And then the number of kids who are on site, the number of kids who are off site, and the percentage of on site and off site who tested positive, those are the things that go in. There's like seven different questions that the principals must do every day by 3 p.m. Most days we've made it by 3 p.m., but that's a tough time for principals. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we got to remember. So that pretty much does it for the opening. Okay? Any other questions, or I'm going to have Jason do his thing? I have just a couple. Uh, just in the interest of, of how's it, how, how are we trending? So we are providing PP&E for anyone who needs it for the cleaning and so forth. We obviously made assumptions on how much we would need. Are we using more than we thought, less than? I think we're pretty good. The, um, you know, the part of that, the uh, pre-purchase of masks that we bought along with the polycarbonate um, we bought enough supplies that I think it's going to hold us for a while. Um, there was ebbs and flows when you could get items like that and when you couldn't. Um, now it looks like there are several places you can get them, but I think we're pretty good right now. Okay. And we, and then, there was a couple other things we had committed to do for the staff, um, including increasing all the air handlers, airflow in all the buildings. Um, again, we talked a little bit about cleaning and that it's coming along, but we would like more cleaners. I think there's a few to approve tonight. We're recruiting a few more. Sure. Could you talk about how we've done everything that we had committed to thus far? Yeah, we, we actually hired three brand new cleaners. We increased a half-time cleaner to full-time, and we have, I might get the number wrong, either eight or nine bus drivers that are working either mid-shift or right after their um, shift to assist with the cleaning. Teacher aides, when available, are sanitized spraying. Uh, we still have an ad out for cleaners, and I know that there's at least two of them that are being interviewed and, and processed throughout this next week. If we get those two, I think we need to stop it at that point. You know, we're, we're pretty good going forward and we don't want to have too many people that down the road we anticipate not needing. So I think, I think that's working pretty well right now. Uh, you had mentioned the air handling units. You know, we, we can adjust the amount of fresh air that comes into our unit ventilators for each classroom or overhead for large uh, spaces like this. The, the drawback is, for example, this morning it was 39 degrees and if we put 30% uh, fresh air in there, the room wouldn't get to be a, a, a comfortable temperature. So our head um, maintenance mechanic is the guy who every day is checking all of those. Uh, we have uh, remote control units so that him, superintendent buildings and grounds, various other people in that department can do that remotely from their laptop. So we are monitoring that and we are pushing as much fresh air into each one of them as we can, being uh, mindful of the temperature of the room. Thank you. How has the, the masks that we issued the students going? Are they, are they wearing those? Are we needing to provide disposable masks on a regular basis? Can you comment on that? So we, we had enough masks to immediately give two of the gray masks like Mr. Michelle has on to every student. Uh, and we have thousands of these blue disposable masks. Um, what we found is that because everything started in March, the vast majority of students have their own mask. 
with, as you saw some from the students that were here. So we think we're good in that area right now. I'd say at least in the high school, about 20% of the kids are wearing these masks we gave. Any other questions? All right, well, while he's getting this ready, um, you know, this is obviously a very fluid situation that uh, we literally this morning, at, I was at a meeting at ECIC kind of coming up with some standards for our league that we've, you know, it's only been since September 4th that we've had certain documents from the state. And so a lot of things are still kind of fluid, but I think we've got a pretty good plan. Um, I want to echo, echo some of the comments people made earlier about Clarence's approach to this, uh, being a, a, you know, an outsider coming in, uh, the transparency in the process and the planning that took place. Um, was was phenomenal. Uh, I've been speaking at, uh, Clarence's praises about that uh, to colleagues and friends all over the place, and I hope that the athletics goes the same way. Um, there's a lot of challenges with athletics, um, but I think we've we've got a plan that um, you know we'll, we'll do uh, pretty well. Um, so uh, just real basic um, objectives. I want to give you a little update on you know the status across the state, what the state has done, and the different things that guide. Um, the athletics plan, um, and I want to kind of talk about all the specifics that we are doing here, um, and some are still ongoing. I was literally texting with a middle school colleague just a minute ago to figure out how we're going to store, you know, personal soccer bags that come in because we're not using locker rooms. So, so we're still working out some of those details. Uh, I just found out Friday that our athletic training services they are not um, going to start until the 28th. Uh, the CEO of Excelsior wanted to hold off for a week, so. Uh, we are, are starting without our, our trainer, uh, so I just learned that on Friday. So there's been a lot of things that are, are continuing to evolve. Um, first, NISFA, New York State Public High School Athletic Association, um, just to give you the, the basics, um, decided that September 21st would be um, the start date for low and moderate risk sports. All high risk sports right now for the fall season, which include football, volleyball, and uh, competitive cheer have been moved to a March 1st start date, and the season of the spring has been pushed back to April 19th start. So they're, they're moving around um, different seasons. There is gonna be some overlap in those seasons, and section six um, does have dual participation. We'll have to cross that bridge a little bit later, but we do allow in section six, it is part of the state, but not all sections do it. Um, we do allow kids to play two sports in the same season, and that may come into um, play here as a football player, may play lacrosse, and, and we would have to work with the coaches to allow, hey, this kid's got a game for lacrosse. We don't want to, you know, have any contact and so on and so forth. So um, I'm confident that that will, will help our situation, that, you know, there's going to be some kids that we don't want them to have to make a choice. We, we'd like them to try to be able to do both if it's feasible. Um, the return to interscholastic athletics guidance, uh, like I said, only came out about um, 17 days ago, and, and that was primarily based on two documents, the interim guidance for the schools, the pre-K through 12, uh, emergency response to COVID, and the interim guidance for sports and recreation. Those two documents have some contrary, um, you know, language in it, and, and that's what makes things very confusing. Um, for example, in physical education class, we have to wear masks all the time. You know, 12, six feet, if you're doing anything aerobic, it has to be 12 feet. Well, in the language for the interim guidance for sports and recreation, which is what you've seen all summer at uh, youth leagues and, you know, youth soccer, there's a term in there that says unable to tolerate. I, I think that's on my uh, a slide later, but um, those types of things are contrary to what we're doing in school, and it's, so it's, it's kind of difficult to, to marry the two. Um, NISFA also did a couple other things. Um, they ex increased the number of practices required for games from six to 10. So in other words, in normal season, you have to have six practices before you're eligible for a game. Because these kids haven't done anything with us in six months, eight months, they push that back, which is extending the season in, into a, a later time. But for safety reason, it makes sense. They've also waived the seven day rule, which means that um, once we get to October 12th, 
Um, we can have practices seven days in a row, including on Sundays, okay, and or games. Um, that may come into play, doesn't have to, but they're trying to make a truncated season, give the kids a little bit more experience. Um, we are only doing league and section play. We're not doing tournaments, and we're not doing non-league games um, up until October 19th. Um, after that, if we want to con you know, kind of play outside the season, we're able to do that. Um, and right now, the only sectionals that we are having is for soccer and field hockey. We're going to have sectional plays for that, but no regional, no state championships, nobody's traveling anywhere. A lot of the other sports, which we've had ECIC championships, for instance, we were supposed to host um, about you know, 26 different schools at our ECIC swimming championships. Um, we're not doing that now. We're not having ECI championships because there's just too many people and too many logistics to do it safely. Okay, so there are some championships. Right now, the winter and spring, they still have dates and those are still on. Um, but as we get closer, they may decide to, to move those. Questions so far? With, with regards to the increase in the required practices um, to 10, now as it stands, we're going to be a day behind others. Is that going to put any contests that are scheduled in jeopardy at this point? Uh, not really. We, we, we reschedule games all the time. Uh, Stacy has already rescheduled some of those games. We've already looked at our first start date and the, and the third, and um, we're, we're moving things um, away from that already, so no impact. Just to give you an idea of what the state is doing right now, um, there are four sections that moved all of their sports to January 1st. Um, section 8 and uh, 11, um, Binghamton Section 4, and uh, Section 9, Lower Hudson. You know, higher dense areas for sure. Um, and, and they've made those decisions, and I'll be honest to tell you that there are some lawsuits going on down there procedurally about, you know, how they made those decisions, and it's, it's getting kind of litigious and um, pretty difficult. Most, the majority are starting this week. Um, there is one, I think, starting on the 28th, yeah, Westchester County, Section 1. Um, you'll see there, Section 6, the NFL League, um, Niagara Frontier League. Um, they are not doing any modified sports. Public, pub, uh, public schools are not doing any public sport or um, any, any sports at all in the fall. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why those leagues um, made their decisions. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of variety um, around the state and what people are doing. Um, Mr. Lumbeck, did you say that you're going to allow uh, players to play two sports in the same season? It, it's possible. It, in, in the fall two season that starts March 1st and goes till sometime in the end of April, the April season, the spring season, is going to start before that one's over. So it wouldn't be a whole season, but there might be a couple of weeks of overlap. And so we, in the section here, section six, we allow dual participation. There are some athletes that might play, you know, for us, you know, it might be a smaller school typically that they do cross country and golf. You know, and they and they work back and forth. Two contact sports would be a, a little different story, but there has to be approval by um, the section to do it. I imagine as we get closer to that, we would probably look at what that's going to look like for for our um, athletes that are you're going to have to choose. You know, we would rather than them not choose between one sport or other. If there's a way that they can have two weeks where they're going to one practice and then going to a game. I mean, the kids do it anyways all throughout the summer and in their youth things. They play multiple sports. So um, we haven't as a league really discussed that, but it is part of our constitution that we, we can allow that. Yeah, I was just thinking if, if someone were to unfortunately get sick, then they could contaminate two teams sure. instead of one. So I'm sure you'll weigh that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Jeff, I think your thing has gone to the next. You can skip over that one. We already know that. Okay, so in our league, um, a couple of decisions that we um, have made is that for indoor, for swimming, um, we are not allowing spectators. Similar to this, most of us have a galley or a gallery or a balcony that we'd only be able to have 15, 20 people if we space them out like this. And because it's indoors um, and the, there's not a lot of deck space, it might be needed for our swimmers to, to have a place to sit when they're waiting to compete. Um, so for our uh, swimmers, we are not allowing any spectators. And, and that's certainly going to uh, present some challenges and some people that are upset. 
Um, for everybody else, what we decided as a league is that we are going to, our ECIC executive director has made, um, has ordered credentials with lanyards like you might see in a state championship. Everybody that's on the field is, has to wear a certain thing. We are gonna provide that for all of the student athletes um, in our league. So each student athlete would get two of these credentials and um, th they would give them to whoever they want. If grandma's in from Boise, Idaho, and she wants you know, to come see the game with you know, the, the child's father, those two go. The next week it might be a girlfriend and the mother, but they are responsible for that. And we have the obligation as a home site just to monitor that the people are there. Now, when it comes to something like, let's say there's a tennis match and there's 20 girls competing, which would mean there's about 40 um, passes allotted, there's only 12 people there and somebody doesn't have it, you know, that would be problematic to go pursuing that person. We would probably let that type of thing stay as long as we're with, within the, the range of numbers. So that's something that the league has come up with to help um, make it consistent, you know, across the, uh, the league. Um, and it'll be up to each member school, you know, um, if, if we decided we didn't do some sports, uh, you know, each school has their own um, prerogative to do what they want. East Aurora, for instance, they're not starting anything until it's 28th. Um, Sweet Home has started. Uh, they have approved um, the low risk tennis, golf and cross country. Tonight they're meeting to talk about the moderate risk sports, you know, swimming and um, field hockey and soccer, and then they could make decisions that are different. So every district may may have something um, a little bit different, but we're all trying to work together to schedule and communicate. All right, um, the the guidance that are in my plan uh, have to do with the Department of Health interim guidance for um, school and the interim guidance for sports and recreation during um, the COVID emergency and the NISFA um, return to interscholastic September, it was made on September 4th. Some of the things that we are doing, the screenings, okay, in-house student athletes, the ones that are coming to school already, that are already here, their screening will have taken place at home. We see them as being already screened and they would continue on outside. The coaches have a roster and they're gonna have which kids are coming from home or which are 100% remote, which by the way is 100% bona fide. They are eligible if they are 100% remote, as long as they're taking three courses plus phys ed, which they all are, they are eligible to participate. Um, those students have been putting um, thermometers in our med kits, so they will all be um, scanned by the coach and they'll also be filling out um, you know, a paper screening. Uh, that was the best way we could figure the model that we're using with the app at school. It would be difficult to give coaches that information or to give me that information, so we're doing it on site. Masks, um, as I mentioned before, the big term is unable to tolerate during activity, okay? And this is where things get a, a little tricky, all right? so. Basically, the guidance that we received from the executive director of the New York State Public High School Athletic Association was that if a student simply tells you, I can't tolerate this and play soccer at the same time, they can take it off, and that's all there is to it. And that's the guidance that the sports and recreation have been doing all summer through their different leagues. However, if they are sitting on the sideline on the bench during you know, common strategic or tactical teaching times, they should be wearing their mask. Um, and, and that is what we are told is the guidance and what is happening across New York State. And that varies from the interim guidance that we have for schools. Can't do that in a school. And that's what gets people a little confused how this is possible. There, and it's, it may be the source of the guidelines, but um, I read somewhere in your documents relative to, I think it was soccer, where it references, you know, this first 20 minute, you know, the dead ball, there's a mass break in that. So is, is that a requirement? Is that, is that part of the guidelines that you're still working out? Is yeah, no, it's an interesting little anomaly that's in there that nobody else mentions mask breaks. Um, they are assuming that kids are wearing masks and they are providing a water break slash. And, and so the sports chairs for across the states kind of, uh, or across the state, kind of developed their recommendations and guidelines for each specific sport because they know them well. So somebody put that one in there and it's not in anything else. Um, but that's assuming that they are wearing a mask, which we don't think many people will be. Um, you know, as, as we've talked as athletic directors, Orchard Park is one school that has said, we are wearing masks, period. 
Um, and you know, Dave, the athletic director, said at least for the first 10 days, because once they start competing and seeing other people aren't, you know, the kids are going to say they you can't tolerate it and want to stop doing it. Um, coaches will always be wearing masks. Uh, officials, again, they have that same kind of thing. If they're running and can't tolerate it, um, they, they um, may not be if they have medical conditions or anything like that, but I expect most uh, officials to be wearing it. We're actually going to be short a little uh, officials, uh, which continues to be a problem in general because people don't want to be around this. Some of the officials are concerned about it, so we're, we're short on officials. Um, certainly on buses, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but. Um, there's going to be a lot of mask wearing, just not during the activity, um, per the guidelines. Sanitizers, um, we've ordered stands. I think they're a little bit on back order. In their med kits, they have um, spray bottles. We are going to set up a trainer tent. We, we're not going to have our training services once they start um, coming inside. We're going to set up a tent by the concession stand out there, which will be his home base. Um, and we'll have uh, the bathrooms open there, wash hands, and um, you know he'll have other um, sanitizers available there. Um, social distancing again, similar things. We're gonna ha we're gonna have to have uh, supervisor of spectators uh, monitoring that. I will be out monitoring that. Um, players and coaches again. Um, when we have we have extra benches, we're going to put out on the fields um, so that when they sit, I know like the Clarence soccer um, clubs, they're they've been very good about the kids. They go to a bag, they have a cone, they go to the cone when they're you know not playing the game, and they stay over there and they don't just kind of all huddle up. Um, so we're going to be applying strategies like that as well. After school is going to be a, a challenging. Um, part of the day, because uh, we're gonna have some kids that are here and at the middle school that are in school and others that are coming from home. The ones coming from home are to report directly to the field. Um, the ones here are gonna have to change their clothes. Um, and what we have established is we have some monitors here at the high school that are um, here till four o'clock, there are three of them. They're gonna help let the kids in the locker rooms in groups of five. One of the biggest challenges to all this is you know, supervising locker rooms. And if we put 30 or 40 kids in a locker room, we're, we are breaking, um, you know, all, all the issues with the locker room. I just have a question. When we talked about this earlier, it was raised that kids could come dressed for their activity. There's, I mean, if you have kids coming to school and they're playing soccer or field hockey or tr track, those kids can come dressed to school to play that activity. It would keep, it would keep them out of the locker room. So yep. I'm just curious. You know, this is a little bit different than what I heard was going to happen, so I wanted to know if that's being explored at this point, because I think the... Well, I think the challenge that we run into is as we get later in the season, now mind you, right now we'd be in the middle of our season, yep. and some sports would be winding up in the next two or three weeks. We're going to get into November, and we're going to get into really cold temperatures, um, really you know wet conditions, and so on and so forth. So we are encouraging everybody to kind of... Um, be prepared to come. The kids coming from home again, 100%, of course, they're directly reporting to the field dressed. Um, but we are pretty sure that we're going to have some kids, um, girls that want to wear a dress to school, et cetera. It's going to be a, a challenge to do that. Will the student athletes be using the bathrooms in the locker rooms? Um, we're we're going to have the concession stands open outside. Um, I mean, those those bathrooms will be open if we open up the locker rooms for a short period of time. The other alternative was to have the coaches with the keys to the locker room. Once everybody got there, they could bring um, the kids into the building to change if they had to. Um, but now we're, we have a supervision issue. We have a time issue where we're losing um, opportunities to practice. So um, the bathrooms are open after school. There, you know, Some of the kids may just go into a bathroom and change real quick and, and head out, use a bathroom. Um, that's something, like I said, is kind of fluid. Our locker rooms at the middle school have, uh, are loaded with desks right now. So the modified kids, you know, again, it's going to be a challenge. Our coaches right now down there, because we don't have the supervisors, are being told that any of the kids should report to them and they would bring them in in, in groups and change. But that's going to take, you know, 20 minutes out of their practice time, which, you know, they have to understand that that's going to happen. I think you probably have a better idea of how many kids will be needing, or how many kids will be reporting from in-person class to the field at the end of the day. Having groups of five in the locker room and a 20 minute time window plus walking to and you know to the field to me seems very tight. It is. And almost unrealistically tight. It is. Keep in mind also, especially for the varsity, you've got a lot of um, kids that go home, they have early dismissal. So they'll go home and come back. 
you know, so we were talking ninth and 10th graders mostly, and then our modified kids. Um, so, and we've reduced, you know, some major sports that have high participation um, numbers. So it, it is gonna be a challenge. Um, and, and this is probably the biggest thing that we're all trying to figure out how to do um, safely. The other part of it is now we're opening up another area that we have to clean afterwards. Um, so, you know, that's an additional space that we're adding to an already stretched um, group of cleaners. I mean, just, just playing this out, if we limit this uh, later, later slide, 23 people on a bus, right? So if we have a, I'm assuming the sports teams are going to be limited in size because if we have to take everyone on a bus, you're going to have 22 kids and a coach, yep. right? Um, I mean, at half, we're going to have 11 kids at school. I mean, and then you can't really play that out because it goes by alphabet, right? So you have 11 kids, you got 11 kids you need to have changed. So that's two groups of five for each sport at a, at a you know, average, we're just averaging. So I, I am concerned about the locker rooms. Yes. I just, I thought we, and I know the season's running later, and I know we had talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, playing outside November in Western New York, I mean, I was a soccer player, it seems problematic to me. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know how we're gonna get there with that either. Well, some of the other parts of, that we could look at as we do our practice schedules and whatnot is using the lights and going later, mm -hmm. sending kids home. You know, we could, we could make, uh, the plan to instead of practicing right after school send them home come back at five to seven and a seven to nine but then we're we're getting into later parts of the night and there, there's no rule that says they have to practice for two hours either yeah. you know we could practice for an hour and a half and um, give them the experience uh, it's, it's not ideal so we're all making some adjustments like that um, but once we get into November 1st we have daylight saving so one you know month after we start you know it gets dark at five o'clock yeah. So we're going to be ha we're going to have to do just the stadium field and lights and go an hour each. And it doesn't sound like there's really any opportunity that will present itself to clean in between each group of five either. No. And the lights that won't be affected from modified because we, we have no no lights are modified. Nope. Their season will be shorter though. They'll be done by November. They're, they have like a five week season. Are we looking at allowing kids to drive like? to co like yes. competitions? Yes, we, we don't feel that we can, uh, well, not kids drive, the parents can drive, sorry. Um, you know, so we, like a senior couldn't drive themselves to their varsity soccer game? We don't think that's a good idea. But parents can drive. And then we've, I've actually already put out, like tomorrow we have gymnastics over the training center in Lancaster, and we have golf tryouts. And we do have a shuttle, but I have reached out to all those parents to see if, you know, just like we did with the schooling, how many would be able to drive on a daily basis? Because the bus numbers, in good times, last year we'd have four or five buses and we would put two or three teams on a bus that was heading to the South Towns. Now, like our soccer, you know, usually they play, both play away. We're gonna have to send one bus, drop one group off, bring the bus back at the other group, and we're gonna have different starting times and, you know, shuttle them back and forth. A lot of the kids go home with their parents, um, but that provides, right now we are told we really have two buses to accommodate all this, so. Um, um, equipment, one of the things that we were asking are kids bring their own equipment, which provides a storage problem during the school day, um, but it, it keeps them from sharing equipment. So uh, the soccer players bring a soccer ball, you know, so they have their own stuff. Um, I'm looking, somebody just asked today if we can get pennies so every kid gets assigned a penny so they're not sharing pennies. We're gonna do that. You know, I could probably get them within a week or so, um, you know, so that they'll have their own pennies for practice so they can, you know, scrimmage each other. Uh, we just talked about the transportation. Um, one of the things that we're trying to consider, um, and I've had a lot of conversation with coaches about this, what is more equitable? Is it cutting down to 23 or keeping a normal amount and having travel teams? which is kind of what colleges do. You know, you are on the travel roster. Um, and and you know, what we would do in that case, let's say we had 28 kids on a team and only 22 could travel, you know, the other two, you know, the bottom six might rotate. You know, one week this group goes, the next week the other goes. Swimming is the biggest um, challenge with this. We'll have 40 to 50 girls um, on the swim team, you know, and if we have meet somewhere else, we're not bringing 40 or 50 girls. Uh, that was a big topic of conversation this morning with ECICs, and most people are in support of keeping more and having a travel roster rather than cutting kids from the experience at all. I, and I question swimming, I'll be honest. I mean, 
I was a swimmer. My yeah. son was captain of the swim team last year, the boys team. And I just question how we're going to take 50 kids and put them in the pool and socially distance them. I mean, swimming works by, you know, there's eight lanes. They yep. swim in all eight. And if you put 50 kids, you're talking about, what, five kids, six kids per lane. And the way it works is they all go down the shallow line and they get their instructions to swim, right? And they do their sets and they come back to the shallow line to get their instructions to swim. No one's wearing a mask. And generally, they're all crowded down in the shallow end. And that's before they even get out of the pool and have to use locker rooms, be on the pool deck, which doesn't have a lot of room to begin with. Um, I just, swimming is a concern for me. Um, that many kids indoors with no masks on top of each other. Yeah, so I can speak a little bit to the thoughts behind swimming. Um, what we're looking at, and we're kind of following some other models like ECC, what, what they're doing is three kids to a, a lane. Um, we have a staggered start where we have a shallow start, a deep end start, and a middle start, and they go in the same direction. Um, and that would maximize 24 kids in the water at a time. Um, this is where the team size comes into play. If we keep the numbers down to 25 or 30 kids, um, we can do that part pretty, pretty well. Uh, if we keep 40 or 50, we're going to have to give kids dry land training to do up in the galley, um, you know, the gallery where they're doing, you know, whether they're doing schoolwork, you know, and they, they all take different turns. Um, the higher level swimmers might have four lanes and they swim for, you know, two hours. The more developing kids might have an hour, you know, in the pool. Um, changing, again, same strategy, half of them. So if you take 30, let's use that number, 15 are coming from home and they're gonna change, they're gonna have sweats on, but they're gonna have their suits on underneath um, going home. And that's what the club swimmers are doing now, you know, and they do that kind of in the winter. They go home kind of wet, they put on a, a big coat. Um, in the locker rooms, what we would do, we would use both locker rooms, the boys and girls, since they're in there, um, and use those locker rooms, again, with the coach's direction, you know, three at a time, four at a time, um, whatever is, is manageable. And uh, those are what, you know, th those are kind of some of the plans that we have for swimming. And uh, I'll be honest, our, our coach and I have spent a lot of time over the weekend trying to figure out um, what we're doing. I've talked to other directors and they're doing very similar things. Are there schools that are not running swimming that we know? Right now, uh, the only one that was, the NFL League is not, um, Niagara Frontier League. Sweet Home was considering it. Um, she thinks what they probably are going to do is they're going to run it and they're going to do virtual meets. And that was a topic that's come up. We just use timing as a virtual meet instead of traveling to and from. Because that, you know, we talk about 30 kids in our pool for practice. Bring us to North or have North come here. And now we're talking 60 kids in that small area. So the virtual meet is something that we are, um, you know, considering. And um, again, if we push things to um, March, we may not have anybody to swim against. It might be a safer environment, you know, things might be um, better in the, in the COVID world, um, but we wouldn't have anybody to compete against. But developmentally, you know, they'll have time. Um, th so that's kind of where we are with swimming. What are your thoughts on, on mask use on the deck? Sounds like there's still gonna be a decent amount of people on the deck. Yeah, well, I, I think we have to have masks on, on the deck anytime they're not in the water. I mean, they're inside. Um, the pool air, as most people know, is, is very different than the other air, and we don't know enough. Um, I've looked at USA Swimming, tried to get some research on you know, the chlorine. A lot of people are just believing that exhaling into the water, you're exhaling into chlorinated water, that that's going to kill it. We don't know that for a fact. Um, they are going to pass one another when they do their laps. Um, so you know, the masks in the pool deck would be a, you know, a definite. So will they, just talking about the logistics of that, are they all entering and exiting the water at the same place? Who, hold, who keeps track of the masks on the deck? They would have to keep track of the masks on the deck. Um, they'd have to, we'd have to have spaces just like we do for soccer or field hockey. They would have their own personal bag. And it was, they get out, if you started in the deep end, you get out in the deep end. If you start in the shallow end, you get out in the shallow end. If you started in the middle, um, you know, you're, you're getting out somewhere else, whether, whether it's a shallow end or deep end. Um, so I, it's important to point out there's three swimming well, there's two. Yeah, if you include the diver, yeah. There's two for the pool deck. Correct. Virtual swimming is really the answer. We've been pushing that at the superintendent level. The other thing we could do virtually is cross country. Or at least we could stagger the starts so that they're not all beginning at the same time. 
Yeah, the staggered start. The virtual cross country is a little tricky because you have different terrain, you know, different times. Swimming is 25. It's 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 the same. I mean, I just I mean, we we have the outdoor sports, which I'm I'm, I'm bored with. I mean, I mean, I'm bored with it. I mean, my daughter's been playing club soccer since July, so yeah. they, they're playing. Those, all those clubs are playing. I, I do have concerns, and I talk with swimming. I mean, just just because I've seen it operate. I mean, I spent the last four years going to meets. It's just concerning to me. I mean, even the virtual meets are great, Jeff. I mean, that would solve at least bringing double the amount of kids into the building, right? That solves that problem. But just watching, I mean, if you limit it to 23, that's controllable. That's two kids to, you know, two and a half kids to a lane, two or three kids to a lane, and, and start them. And you could space 23 kids out. But I think if we got a roster of 50, yeah, in that in that in that pool area, where are you going to put 50 kids? Like I, I just. We're not gonna be able to I mean, I, 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 I'm something's problematic for me, but I certainly would not want to exceed 22 or 23 kids right off the bat. I mean, we got problems even with that number, and I just don't see them staying separated in the water without masks. Yeah. I mean, just go watch a, a, a practice. They all stand in the shallow end, and coach tells them, you know, work on this space. That they're not going to be six feet apart. No, and, that, and that's why that staggered kind of, yeah. you know. But, but when, they, when they're getting their instructions, they're not going to be six feet They're going to have to do that. They're going to they're gonna start shallow, middle, deep, but they're going to end in the shallow because that's where they get their next set of instructions for yeah. what, how. That's the coaches happen. tell me that they can do this. And, and, you know, just to put it in perspective, too, soccer players are running out there without masks and they're battling for a ball, and that's what the Department of Health, you know, has, has said is okay. And I know it's different outside and inside. And I don't disagree with you at all, you know, but the coaches are telling me, you know, that they can do this. Other schools are telling us that they can do it. Um, it's a tough one for sure. Um, a couple question. of challenges. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Trish. I said one question on the swimming. Um, I know you said there's no spectators. Are you considering, like, if there actually is a meet, that someone would film it so you can, like, post the link? We, for we do have now a, uh, a, a package called Huddle. Um, which has a streaming capacity, which is um, more intended for the stadium, but I haven't looked, I haven't had time to look into whether or not we have the ability to stream it, um, you know, from the pool deck, but we would require somebody to, to man the camera. It's not, there are some systems out there that mount in the gym, for instance, that automatically do it. They have an algorithm that follows the ball, you know. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet, um, but we do have some capacity, even if it's using a camera and a, and a laptop with a, a, a connection. Um, but we would need somebody to man that. Okay. A um, couple challenges that we face, you know, is the transportation um, is, is a huge part of it. We've kind of already discussed that. Um, our bus capacity right now is about two buses that we know of every day. You know, we will post jobs. Um, we might be able to get more, but our drivers are taxed. I mean, they're going all day. Um, you know, we often will have a mechanic run our shuttle runs. They'll, they'll come off and they're certified drivers and they'll do uh, a shuttle uh, for us. And we're gonna need that to the gymnastics training center because again, our gym space for gymnastics was, um, you know, taken away for cafeteria at the high school. So our coach actually owns the gymnastics sports academy um, in Lancaster and that's where we're gonna train. And uh, we will be shuttling kids uh, over there every day. And we generally shuttle our golfers, um, whether it's to a game or to the driving range or something every day as well. Um, we talked about the, the traveling, you know, and the individual sports and, and the, um, the need we're gonna have um, to keep the numbers low. Um, I've talked, like I said, I've talked to a number of coaches and they are, are comfortable doing, you know, a few more and rotating them around. Um, and obviously, students must adhere to the health and safety protocols. Um, you know, this is critical. You know, the entire team needs to be quarantined for 14 days if there is a case during, um, you know, their game. We're playing West Seneca, and somebody has it. Both teams uh, very likely could be quarantined for 14 days. That takes 50 kids out of the school system um, in person, and that's pretty significant. Uh, contradictory guidelines are a problem. Um, added cost for a supervisor of spectators are virtually all the contests. I mean, we have to have somebody here every day, and that's including me, um, but at the middle school, if we have contests there, we're gonna have to have somebody there. We're gonna have to have somebody, we don't need them at every site. I think with the lanyard system that we have, we can have one 
rotating around and, and just making sure that people are staying socially distant, spectators are wearing masks, and that they have their passes. Um, some schools uh, want to do a check-in where they're going to have a QR code that when you get there, you have to scan it in. We're trying to compile all that what the individual schools want. So our parents know if we're going to Orchard Park and I have my pass, I still might have to sign in. Um, so we're working through that 60 minute rule we talked about. Weather and daylight, you know, we're getting to the end of, of the fall and uh, we run out of daylight. Um, so just the considerations, and these were split votes at our athletic director meetings, the modified sports, um, it was like a eight no and 15 yes um, to that swimming. We had a survey response that um, most schools seemed at the beginning, they weren't gonna do swimming, but now they've all come around and they're doing swimming. So they voted to have swimming. Um, you know, so we did talk about the no spectator rule and gymnastics we have to move. So. Those are the three that present the biggest challenge, the modified sports, just with the supervision of the locker rooms, changing, busing, you know, all that. Typically, we like to keep a lot of kids at the modified level, um, you know, and, and we're gonna have to really look at that, at the numbers of, the number of kids trying out. Um, how, how many kids do we carry on the cross country team usually? Uh, between boys and girls, yeah. upwards of 70 or 80. Yeah, I, and the other thing, I, I guess the numbers concern me a little bit, and I, I don't mean to harp on this, but I think, I coached, and I think controlling 22 kids and keeping them distanced and apart when they're not doing their activity, and controlling 60 or 70 kids with a single coach, that that's problematic. Yeah. I mean, when you agree, I mean, sure. and then and and soccer, if you watch them play, yes, they're running in and out and they're outside, but they're when they're sitting on the bench, they are all distanced and they're wearing masks, and there's you know it's easy for a coach to keep track of the five kids that he ha he or she has on the bench. I think, you know, you look at swimming, you look at cross country, and, and, and those are great sports, and they, we, we never had to cut on any of those. And part of it is cross country is a great sport for someone who doesn't make the soccer team, right? They run cross country, on their off, on their off time they play travel. But I, I, I'm really concerned if we don't limit numbers. I mean, I know you want to have like a travel team, sure. or a regular team, but the, the amount of kids, I hate to restrict opportunities, but I think if we have 70 kids standing around on a field, you're gonna have kids standing on top of each other. And, and their plan is to um, create little pods of four to five kids. Um, you know, and, and cross country is inherently one of these sports where you have to trust kids. They go out and run trails, and the coach, you know, you have two coaches and 70 kids. You know, they're on their own. Yeah. And um, during warm ups and instructional times and things like that, their plan is to put, you know, you know pods of four or five kids that are working over here. They're all doing their warm ups together, but they're, you know, vastly separated. Um, and I don't disagree with you. The numbers concern me as well. Um, you know, and, and that's what's also going to happen because we're not doing football and we're not doing yes. volleyball. We've got kids that typically play those sports that are going out for other sports. We've got 26 kids going out for golf right now for boys golf. We've never had that many. And it's kids that you know, play football or volleyball and they like to golf. Hey, you know what, I'm going to try golf. And you know, some of them might be pretty good. What do we do with a kid that's been on the team for three years and this, this kid comes along from volleyball who's a sophomore and you know, beats them, you know, in, in the tryouts. Are we going to keep the kid who probably most likely is going to play volleyball next year when things return to normal, you know, or do we displace the kid that's already been a part of the team, you know? So there's some other nuances to this cutting, um, you know, and travel teams and, you know, moving sports um, that we have to consider. And, and it's a hard issue because we did a really good job opening. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think Clarence, the staff, and the teachers, the, Every cleaners, everyone did an amazing job opening. And the sports have the possibility to tip that, right? Because one kid on a team of 70 yeah. gets COVID. We could have seven, I know we're gonna talk about cohorting them or breaking them up, but there's the possibility of, of, of a lot of kids being sure. impacted, right? And then we have that many kids at school for two weeks. And or a teacher, that's a teacher coaching, right? Yeah. And we do have sub issues, so. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges and you know, the other part of it for me that balances into this is the mental health of these kids. As you heard Ken talk in the beginning, you know, they're, they're sitting behind like their zoo animals and you know, there's nobody that's gonna advocate for kids moving you know, more than me and I know you all would, would agree with that but it's a tough balance. You know, these kids need something you know, to keep them motivated and keep them going. Um, sports is one of those things for some kids. So at the end of the day, we are recommending um, all of the sports um, Move, move forward as determined by the state for this fall season.
I just want to say I really feel like the same level of care and consideration that went into the opening of school is going into uh, bringing back the fall athletics and Clarence has had I think one of the most solid reopenings in Western New York. So for sure. Thank you for all the work you put into all of this. Yeah. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about more, a little more about gymnastics? Um, number of kids, transportation back and forth, cost to the facility use, cleaning procedures that are in place at the at the gymnastics place. Yeah, good question. Uh, Mike Prelowitz, our, our coach, and I have been um, doing a lot of communicating. We typically have about 12 girls that do gymnastics. That's not a huge number. Um, we are, right now, we do have a shuttle that's going to go that direction every day, um, but we also have parents that are willing to drive. Um, so we might be able to take, you know, the tennis team, you know, on the, you know, from um, if they're going away to play Lancaster and so on, we might be able to combine two small teams on a bus. Um, the facility, um, as far as I know right now, we haven't, um, he hasn't required any kind of uh, financial um, commitment. We do have a non-harm um, agreement that we're signing um, tomorrow for insurance purposes. We're gonna provide them with our insurance. Um, they are under very strict orders as well. They have a capacity. One of the challenges with the gymnastics is he has his club program and he's only allowed a certain number of kids in his gym at a time and infusing our kids into it is going to be tricky. So some of our, our scheduling with them are going to be Saturdays and Sundays, and maybe a later night or an earlier day, 5.30 is like their busiest time. So we're going to try to get our kids right over there at you know, 3.45 to 5. So it'll only be an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half um, time-wise. But a lot of these kids compete in these gyms anyways. You know, most of the, I would say, you know, 90% of them either go to Stumps or go to his gym or one other gym. Um, and do their competing or their, their training at six afterwards. So they're already there. Um, but I don't know uh, procedurally exactly, it's a fair question um, what they're doing, uh, but I know they're complying with the guidance that they've been given in terms of their capacity. So will Clarence students interact with anyone else there during the Clarence time? Yes. They will? Yes. And how, will they change here before they go or they yeah. change there? They will change here. They will get there either from home, ready to go, or we can get them changed here before they get on the bus. So it wouldn't be any locker rooms or changing in bathrooms over there. Do you know what what the capacity at the end of I don't know. I don't know the actual number. I, I want to say it's like 45 or 50 kids um, in his space, you know, based on square footage. I can get those that information for you. For, if no one else has anything, you know, for me, I, I'm supportive of the plan. I would echo uh, Mary Beth's comments. I think it's well thought out, it's vetted. It obviously was not just the first plan that you put the paper, you thought through it, you refined it and refined it again. And yep. as you will do it to, more. You'll continue to refine it. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, for me, I guess the overarching is just we can't take a step back. We've done such a good job getting the schools open and keeping the kids safe and uh, keeping the kids engaged in the classroom in that we haven't had to shut down. We've had one positive knock on wood. We haven't had to deal with a lot of positives which impact a lot of students and families' lives. So I'd hate to see us take a step back with this. So that would just be my overarching message. And I think the fact that we could, uh, if there are is a message to take to the students. If there is a positive on the team, the team is basically out of commission. And I think that can be a motivator to itself, to the students to do the right thing to make sure that they have that opportunity that they desperately want to compete. So, so I thank you for what you've shared. I appreciate that. Do you, know, do you know if the other participants at the gymnastics center, are, are, is the leadership of the gymnastics center under the same obligations to report if another child at the gymnastics center in the same facility as our students is positive. How are we, how assured are we that that reporting mechanism will be as stringent as ours? We're pretty sure uh, because that is the requirement of the Department of Health for every entity that's open. So they would not be able to, as a gym, they actually have some rather stringent sanitization procedures that are necessary. But we're, we're positive that we will know. If our kids were in at the same time as, as other groups of kids, and someone from that other group of kids tested positive, we'll have the information. It, 
whether or not our kids will be considered close contacts well, is up to the with, tracers. You know, the equipment they were using and where they were. Right. At so, so do do our students fall under the rules of a gym when they're there as in regards to wearing a mask, which you have to wear the entire time you're there, or the school, the activity rules? We're going to make it the school activity rules uh, that they have to be here to the gym. But again, that's up to our coaches to enforce. So I'm not sure that kids, while they're on the apparatus, will have masks on. If, I'm not sure they'll be able to tolerate that. Uh, but if they're waiting their turn, or if they're sitting on the sidelines, I haven't been to many gymnastics meets, but I'm assuming that the kids sit around the equipment and rotate from one piece of equipment to another. They're going to have to have their masks on, just like kids who would have on the bench if they were playing soccer, or just like kids who are on the pool deck would have if they're swimming. So, you know, Jason's made it clear to our coaches what the expectations are. The other expectation is you just can't keep as many kids as you're used to keeping. It's just not possible. We want to be able to give kids the opportunity. We want them to be involved in athletics, but we can't keep sizes of uh, teams that are gigantic. It just it won't work, and we can't supervise them properly. No. So a place like cross country, which was the you know the catch-all for every student that wanted to do something, we might not be able to offer that this particular season. And I guess that's where I am, Jeff. I, can, uh, I think you did an amazing job. It's well thought out, and I think I'm completely fine supporting the sports. I just think we have to say there's a number of restrictions because I, I don't want to leave that up in the air for to find out we've got 60 kids and we look out in the field and they're all standing together and we, we got a problem. And even swimming, we've got 50 girls. Like I, I know the coaches say they can do it, but saying you can do it and dealing with that many kids is two different things. And I just... I'm 100% supportive of this. I can get behind this, but I just think we've got to limit the numbers of the teams and say that's the, these are the numbers. I, I'd be uncomfortable with 60 or 70 kids or 50 kids in any of these sports. So that's my personal opinion. I don't know what the board thinks, but that, that and I'm all for giving opportunities. I don't think, I agree mental health wise, they should be playing. I just don't think, I think when you're 50 or 60 or 70 kids, we're looking for a problem with, with a, a positive, a positive case. So uh, that would be my one caveat to the plan is just that we set the number. I mean, the number will differ by sport, I guess. You know, just 50, 60, or 70 is not, I don't think, no. the number. You can't have 60 kids. It's too big. Yep. The coaches will want that because this is what they're used to. But this is why God invented athletic directors and you can just <laughs> make sure that they, can, they cannot roster numbers of the kids because it just conflicts with everything we're trying to do. It's a fair compromise. Yeah. Yeah. So I think really cross country and swimming. All the others who the team, you know, soccer, et cetera, those are going to be in the low twenties. Based on historical sizes, those would appear to be the two most problematic. Mm -hmm. okay. But you're right, even golf, right? It's got twenty. Well, they will keep that. I mean, yeah. He's only going to keep ten or twelve. Yeah. But it's just interesting that all these kids Try out for something yep. that they've never played before. And, um, you know, the natural attrition and process will take care of a lot of that. One note on the gymnastics thing, I, I do know in the beginning they can't because of their community, because of the mask rides up and around, doing some kind of common thing. So when they're competing, they're not wearing masks, but around the community. So other schools would come to that gymnastics yeah, center all to compete the meetings, against? Five out of six schools that host cannot host. Yeah, I think it would be important for us to to have a better understanding of making sure that the cleaning procedures are up to our expectations that we would provide if the events were hosted here. Sure. And the other thing, there's no tri meets or quad meets. It's one school against yeah. another school, and that's how it's going to be um, restricted. Well, they're sanitizing each apparatus, right, in between when one yeah. school. That's so what. Right. I think it I think it just speaks to the fact that the students are desperate for some sort some sort of activity. Yeah. And this is why somebody who has no other choice but maybe they hate golf and, and they <laughs> they still try out they're still trying out for golf, right? <laughs> right.
but I think it's I, I think you know giving them opportunities to do this stuff, even if it's not their favorite sport, it's doing something. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's important. Just one other quick thing: extracurriculars are also on the agenda for today. Um, what we've asked is that any extracurricular club that could enact their uh, purpose remotely, that we will uh, recommend to the board of that. So everything that you have in there are things that can be done remotely. And for the most part, they'll exclusively be done remotely. The only difference would be the fall play and the musical, musical at the middle school and the high school, and fall play at the middle school. But we're limiting their rehearsal times. And we talked to Lou Vitello today. He's going to try to do some virtual rehearsals with the kids as well as in person. So again, we're going to do everything we can there, but we don't want to, it's not fair to say you can play soccer, but you can't be in the fall play. Um, from our perspective. So we, we want to make sure those kids have that opportunity. And that's another tough one, at least in the middle school, right? Because we have, I mean, the middle school, they almost have 100 kids that are in that middle school musical. Um, so we got a couple months they, before they start. They do an amazing job with that. So yeah. that, that's a tough situation. So on that note, do, do we have, I mean, we're going to, we're going to assemble, you know, the, the the advisors we're gonna we're gonna run the club we're gonna prepare for a play and a musical which it's likely not going to actually happen is there a plan to do it virtually or virtually. tape it and so no just the way we're going to do the concerts mm -hmm. for vocal and instrumental uh, the kids will be spaced in the auditorium we'll have tim doing the live stream and they will run the they'll run the fall play and the musical that way as so long as well as the concerts. And for the musical, we're going to require the kids masks during the musical? During rehearsals, yes. Then during the musical, we have yet to figure out. It's, it's just a, uh, my, my daughter's at the ATA, and they did musicals throughout the summer. They actually did the musicals masked. They did? The entire musical. And they staged the musical they did on Little Mermaid, which we, we have done. And they staged the kids so they were six feet apart throughout the entire musical. So it, it can be done, and I think if we should consider it. Right. We're going to do that. Luckily, we have a little time. For yes. Time. Jeff, it didn't look like many of the extra, I don't think any extra curriculars were actually taken off. Do you know? Well, I think they were all pretty I, much virtually. I think. Do you remember, Rob, right? where <clears throat> not recommended? Uh, at this time, at the intramural program, I know, was not recommended in the middle school. There were a couple clubs here or there in the high school that those advisors decided not to run those clubs. I think there was <clears throat> some vocal or language clubs that are not active. There were there were a few. Intramurals are a big one. That's the huge participation. They do it before school, which is can't accommodate. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Dr. X. Thank you, Jason. Might have moved forward. Uh, next on the agenda is the finances with Mr. Mancuso. So we have uh, three items tonight. The first item is the district safety plan. Uh, I brought the entire plan. It's quite a few pages. It is up on the website, uh, updated for um, 2020. Other than a few items in there, the main update is um, BOCES Safety Risk Service has prepared a pandemic addendum for that plan, and that's shared with all districts. So it's pretty much a generic um, plan that's put together. Each building principal is in the process of entering um, on the state's website their specific plan, which has details that are confidential for that building for emergencies. Uh, those are being updated now. We're updating the in-building sheets, or I'm sorry, in-classroom sheets that have the quick reference guide for everybody. Most of them are pretty good now. We're, we're just doing some names in, and changes like that. Um, and those plans will be updated no later than October 1st when they're due on the state's website. Uh, I've also attached the um, safety item update from the safety committee. We've got several items on there that were the last items that the district wide safety committee looked at and I uh, updated all of the items there. I plan on sometime um, October to have a virtual meeting with the safety committee. Um, 
will Google Meet or Zoom it. Um, the last item on there, um, I guess it's in purple, is the app that we were processing. We were ready in uh, March to start moving forward on this app, and I've, I've got a lot of detail on there for you. Um, the app is still ours, and we are going to still work with it. The company who we have to work with, um, we're targeting now, I think, mid-October to meet with them again. Uh, this app is very inclusive. If you look at it, it has every plan for every building will be uploaded. Um, it will be, you know, it's called Rapid Responder, and really that's what it does. It will allow a multitude of people, whoever we allow to use it, to make almost any kind of notification to um, any true responder. Um, it will allow us to immediately let um, Harris Hill Elementary know if the middle school is in lockdown and why. So we've got quite a bit we uh, wanted to, our goal originally was to start the implementation in March and have it ready for this September. Um, you know, we, we have to see with the company how that's gonna take. We're gonna just get into it now, as I mentioned, in mid-October. <clears throat> with regards to some of these items, um, I know we've talked about them in the past. Um, you know, some are still open. Um, some I noticed that we didn't even order some numbers yet, which I thought had been done. It, do we have, to, to the point of the app and that, do we have targeted completion dates that we can have against all these items? Yes, we do. I don't have them listed on there, but we do, and that's one of the things that I, I want to have um, uh, the safety committee take a look at. You know, what's a priority for some of these items? Um, with every single one of our cleaners, custodians, mechanics, and grounds workers sanitizing the buildings, they're not going to get done tomorrow. I think it would be good whether, because um, we'll talk about goals in a bit, it is one of the goal items. Um, so whether it be, depending on the timing of the October virtual meeting, whether our meeting is after that or it's a November meeting, I think that would be timely to get an update on what the, the deliverables are for the coming year. Absolutely. I do think that we really need to focus on getting those outside numbers complete. That's been quite a long time in the process and a lot of the first responders felt that that was the most critical component missing in our buildings. I think four of the buildings were done and the two are still open. Yeah, I was just, I was a little concerned that it said we hadn't even ordered those two buildings numbers yet. I know we have, we were behind on some installs. Right. Ledgeview and Harris Hill are the two that we'll get on. Harris Hill has them. The numbers on the windows, is that what we're talking about? Harris Hill has yes. them. Okay. I'll take a look and see which, I, I know there's two that didn't have them. Um, I have a safety thing. Uh, I, I go to the different schools and walk with my dogs every night. And I was, as far as safety, the playground, uh, I know normally we put like mulch down in the beginning of the year, but uh, like Harris Hill, um, Ledgeview, the weeds are like overtaking the whole playground. And on Harris Hill's playground, there's like broken swings. And I just think every night there's kids on it and it's like a safety issue as far as the community, like I don't, I, obviously I don't know if the schools are using them or I thought we said they weren't because of COVID, but I still think there's kids on them every night and we'll be held liable if, you know, <laughs> if the, the swings are like hanging and broken and like I know the mulch hasn't been done, so I don't know if there's plans in the works to put mulch at all the playgrounds. I'm assuming I, I've at least been to three schools, there's no mulch and the weeds are like literally almost over my, it's just, I, someone needs to weed it I think too. Sure, and um, again, maybe we should just close those off. We are not using the playgrounds for the schools, and to be honest, we did not have time to do those kinds of things. Um, I, I, I know every staff member is working as many overtime hours as they can just to get the students in the school. Um, I will take a look at that because we certainly don't want anything that's a safety item to be um, uh, out there and liable we may just have to take a few things down. Next item. Next item is the annual external audit. 
Um, it was done a little bit different this year uh, because a lot of it was done uh, remotely. Um, but, but again, we're in a great financial position. Um, there are no comments other than the typical fund balance comment on the audit. Um, everything was performed uh, by Lemson and McCormick, uh, and I sent everything to the audit committee. The end of this school year or the beginning of next is the required RFP for both internal and external audit services. So um, usually the second half of the school year, um, we'll start to get that together. With regards to the report, it's, it's uh, marked draft. I refresh my memory process-wise. Do we have to accept it? It's a draft, it yes. Official? When you accept it, and then we'll upload it um, later this week okay. uh, after board acceptance. Okay. The last item we have is a schedule of bills. Um, the July financial reports weren't ready for this meeting, uh, which is typical closing the year out. Uh, July and August will be at the October meeting. Um, I did want to mention I did also include a capital project update with this. And surprisingly, New York State is right on schedule with all their capital project reviews. So um, the, re the summary that I gave you, we are right where we want to be. Um, should things progress this way, we do uh, plan on having approval late fall, uh, bidding hopefully no later than December, and take the awards to you, well, the bids to you for your award at the January board meeting. And that's for the first half of the project, which is Clarence Center, Ledgeview, the middle school, and the bus garage. Um, one other note. We were able to take back one of those six contracted runs. So um, uh, Linda and the crew at the bus garage um, did quite a bit of work this summer trying to reroute things to make sure that there was no more than 23 students on a bus. And the midday routing and taking students to the Y and to other out of elementary zone daycare centers. Uh, but through all of that, um, with the large number of bus drivers that did return, we were able to remove one of those contracts. Any questions on the financial items? The only question I'll, I'll ask, and, I, and, and thank you for mentioning that we don't have the July and August reports. I know it takes some time to close them, year-end audits and the like, and there's always a, a lag. So I'm glad to hear they'll be in next month. I guess my question is, while we're always behind on the official, when we're meeting in a month, so like now, September uh, 21st, is there an opportunity to share unofficial, if you will, kind of revenue expense numbers for the preceding month? And the reason I ask is, as we're going through the balance of this year, and we don't know whether we're gonna get a revenue cut or not, I think we need to be very current in understanding how our revenue is coming in, if we have, have holdbacks, if sales tax is coming in under, et cetera, relative to our exceptions, as current to real time as possible. So There's really no, um, I can't give you a draft, let's say, on an interim basis of the way things are, but that's why we, one of the reasons we initiated this cover page to the reports. So every board meeting, uh, and that's where I've always listed when sales tax comes in and how it comes in. You know, um, our district treasurer and myself are monitoring everything every day. Um, to, to, to this day, based on last year, um, we are exactly where we were. But we know that that was gonna be the case. Um, there's almost no withholding of funds at this point in time. New York State aid for the beginning of the year, which is the fall, is really a, a pullback of the TRS payment. And our sales tax payment uh, for the first quarter uh, will come in probably the first week in October. And certainly at each board meeting, you'll get updates on that. But um, the way the book work goes in the office, things aren't posted until they're posted. 
And um, everybody who's, there's about three or four people who are preparing those reports, reviewed by the treasurer and then myself, um, you know, we'll keep you up to date on, on any news, certainly, and, and that's why we, we thought we did the, the cover sheets. And again, I, I don't recall what system we use versus other districts, but I, I know other districts are, at least appear to be sharing, certainly not system generated reports, it definitely looks like an Excel schedule or something, but as an example, I looked at two other districts who had meetings in September, at, uh, early September, and they had July results that they had shared. So I guess I just wanna reemphasize that, you know, the importance of having the information timely. Um, especially as we're going into the, you know, this tumultuous time. My fear is that we do have a clawback from the state. It happens later and we are trending along on our expenses to budget and everything is going you know, swimmingly, but uh, we don't have an opportunity to react. And the more we don't have an opportunity to react, the more money we're pulling out of fund balance this year, which then hurts us further the year after. So. Um, Again, we don't, we don't need to belabor it, I guess, just whatever we could do to make us aware as soon as possible. Absolutely. I just have one quick question. On one of the payments, there was a site license for e-books for the elementary buildings. Are we doing that for the middle school and the high school as well? Each of the buildings, yes. Okay. Yeah. So we just didn't get that bill yet? Right. Yeah. So, thank you. Any other questions? Do we need a separate uh, motion for the audit, or can it be in? Uh, no, it could be the same. Okay. So I guess, uh, could I get a motion to approve items F1 to F3 in the financial section? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries. All right. Uh, personnel? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Michelle. Fuchs. We have two informational items of grade level changes. Under P2 for appointments, we have three new teachers that replace retirements. Additional compensation for new student screening, department grade level chairperson positions, mentor appointments for our new teachers. Under G extracurricular, we have clubs and activities for both the middle school and the high school. P3 is the approval of staff for additional CSE summer hours. P4, the approval for the additional summer guidance hours at the middle school. We also have summer curriculum project requests from Mrs. Overholt a list of presentation compensation list and additions and deletions to our substitute list. For the addendum, letter G, extracurricular, we have a revised fall sports recommendation from Mr. Lembeck containing one coaching assignment change. Mr. Matthew Andrews will be serving as the interim varsity girls soccer coach. Does anybody have any questions on the instructional portion of the personnel agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve P1 to P7, which would include the addendum to uh, item G and the athletic uh, appointments. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Non-instructional? Non-instructional, P8 amends previously approved start dates for two of our employees. In our P9 resignation section, we have six other support staff that have resigned, but to note, we have a retirement upcoming of Mrs. Cheryl Rollo, who has served the district for 20 years as a clerk typist in district office, high school offices, attendants, but most notably in the music office and support of all of the musical activities in the district. Uh, P10 is temporary increases for hours for aides and a shift change for one cleaner. P11 are two unpaid leaves of absence and one extended FMLA leave. Uh, under appointments, we have a new nurse at Sheridan Hill, three teacher aides, and three lifeguards. P13 can, contains our substitute lists for the non-instructional, those that are added and deleted. Anybody have any questions on non-instructional? Just seeing none before uh, moving uh, for a motion. Certainly uh, wish Cheryl Lolo uh, all the best on her retirement after 20 years of service to the district. Uh, could I have a motion to approve P8 to P13? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It carries. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Hicks, special needs and student activities? Uh, there's only a handful, a uh, very small amount. Does anybody have any questions on the special needs and student activity items S1 and S2? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve those? Motion. A motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carries. Okay. Um, board development. We have the 2020-21 uh, goals uh, for the board that are uh, on the docket for approval this evening after our discussion last month. Uh, does anybody uh, have any items to discuss relative to those? Um, I had just asked uh, today if we could add one um, on cultural uh, diversity and equity. And I know you had sent uh, the language, um, the proposed language around uh, to the group a little bit earlier today for consideration. Um, it, reading it's integrated deeper knowledge of cultural diversity and equity into existing character education programs, professional development, and community service opportunities for students. Is there any discussion on that? My only comment is that we did suspend community service for this school year. Uh, I mean, for me, I'm supportive of incorporating the cultural diversity element into the goals, um, whether it be a standalone or incorporate into an existing item. Anybody have any concerns with doing so? I'm in support of it. So the fair um, Mary Beth under student learning and achievement as a sub item underneath that. Yes, okay. thank you. So <clears throat> I guess given that we have an item in the packet for approval, I would need a motion to amend the goals in the packet to add uh, item three under student learning and achievement that would read, uh, integrate a deeper knowledge of cultural diversity and equity into existing character education and professional development I would agree, strike community service at least for this year. Yeah. Thank you. So could I get a motion so to moved. amend the goals? Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of amending the goals to add that language? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right, that being said, um, is there any other discussion before we vote on those amended goals? Can I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Approved. Thank you very much. So that is the, the only um, item under that's on the agenda. I guess if I could just mention two things briefly as it relates to board development. I did. Um, it's not on the agenda, but I did send everyone the 2020 pr proposed NISPA uh, resolutions earlier today, uh, which NISPA has, I don't know if these are the final, uh, but we have that uh, virtual conference coming up at the end of October, and we typically, uh, through the delegate body, vote to support the resolutions they support and so forth. Uh, I would just ask people to review those, that we should probably talk about it at next month's meeting and provide guidance to whomever will be the delegate uh, for that meeting. And then second uh, to that, uh, we did talk about uh, rotating assignments for the PTOs uh, the coming year. Uh, we do have a scheduled meeting circulating amongst the board uh, to ensure that we have a multitude of opportunities to visit the various schools. Um, thank you, Mary Buck, for setting up a more user-friendly tool than I did uh, <laughs> through uh, some technology. Um, and we'll make sure that once that is uh, completed, we'll post it to the website and the uh, PTO presidents I've emailed to let them know I would send them the schedule as well. Um, so I think that's Mike, all I have. I have a question or a comment on the actual list that was sent out. It said that the middle school was gonna be in the library, but those are virtual meetings as well. Um, I don't, the middle school Per the list that was currently assembled, the September meeting is virtual. 
The October meeting and all the successive months are listed as library presently. It did not say virtual, so I have to, I will confirm. That. Are we allowing people back in the building, groups? Uh, we haven't had a conversation with the PTOs, but we're not allowing anybody else. And we probably would not allow the PTOs either. So I, I get the impression that everything was just set with the default location and we'll adjust as we go through, but uh, good question, Don. Okay, um, with that, it brings us to our second public comment session for the evening. Any comments? <laughs> yes. Um, if you wouldn't mind for the recording. Thank you. Siobhan Como, 6320 Utley Road. I just have a question about the sports, because I'm just trying to figure it out for my daughter. Do tryouts count as practices? So what is the earliest start date a game could be? Because if you can't have consecutive practices yet, right? So what's the, I'm just wondering, because like field hockey schedule's out, it says 10-2, which I'm guessing can't be 10-2. Okay, so like 10-5 is the start? I think it's 10 tomorrow. Okay, okay, just want to see the, how that worked. That's it, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, in our packet, we have a list of upcoming meetings. Uh, our next board meeting is scheduled for Monday, October 19th. Uh, currently, Hi. we're slated to be at Clarence Center Elementary um, in the library. M Mr. Fuchs? Yes. We have three emails for public comment oh. since we've oh. been in the meeting. Thank you. I forgot about the uh, virtual component today. Uh, first one is from Emma Faso. Dear board, my name is Emma Faso. I'm an alumni of the women's soccer team and currently play NCAA soccer. I'm writing this brief message about Coach Dave Steffen. You will see all the girls on live stream and in person. We are alumni, current players that are standing up for him. We, are, we support, support Coach and hope you will reconsider your decision. He's changed all of our lives for the better. And as a collegiate athlete, I can say that he was the greatest coach I've ever had. He is a great mentor, friend, and coach. Please read our emails to the athletic director and the superintendent. Thank you for your time, Emma Faso. Our second one is from Jamie Enzer. Good evening, board. Thank you for live streaming tonight's event. We are in strong favor of the Clar Clarence approving low-risk false sports. The data exists why we should be able to move forward. We feel with what you have proposed, Clarence guidelines in place, our children will be safe during the short season. Our children need sports more than ever, and we are confident that they will be successful with the parameters that you will put into place. Thank you, Jamie Enzer. The last one is from Cheryl Honecker, and it just asks for the board to please address the use of the pool for the swim club. Thank you, Mr. Michelle, I forgot about that. Um, there's no other questions or comments. I would entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the evaluation of a particular employee. So moved, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good night, everyone.